those who would blithely proclaim the death of God would do well to consider that they can never produce the corpse any more than believers can produce the body of the living God. And we may have created God in our image. And as our idea of ourselves changes, the idea of God changes over time, forever recycled, forever dying, forever reborn anew. This creation, this procreation, I say, can never die because creation, recreation, is in the very nature of things. Because we know in our bones and in our minds that Hardy's poem, Transformations, is factually right. Everything in the world, even ourselves, even the thoughts that we think are not gone, but are recycled. They're made up of broken down bits of earlier forms. Astrophysicists tell us that everything we see, and even the consciousness to see them, is made from the wreckage of spent stars. Life from death, but life transformed. Behold, I shall show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall be changed. Just as the egg dies to become the bird, just as the rabbit changes into its progeny, just as the lily reemerges every year from the muck, just as the mortal Jesus had changed into the moral principle of loving kindness, life, creation itself, keeps going on, transforming, recycling, making anew. So what if the conscious selves we are now will not be conscious of what we become? Jesus has been gone two millennia, but he's still here. Where will we be in two millennia? We will be likewise. We will be everywhere and nowhere, like a quantum particle. Behold, I shall show you a mystery. Freud said that death is the ultimate goal of life, but the ultimate goal of death is transformation, new worlds waiting to be born. And my friends, a new religion is thus waiting to be born. But those that are living must first die. I sense we are seeing in our time the beginnings of their death struggle of the old ways. Fundamental theists grow ever more shrill in their insistence on patent absurdities. Fundamental atheists grow increasingly shrill in their mockery of these absurdities. I don't, however, see atheism as some inevitable victor. For the history of ideas doesn't work like that. The history of ideas works through dialectic, the clash of opposing ideas that produces a new idea out of the wreckage, new life from death. This is the church of the future, the religion of the future I speak of, combining what is useful and nourishing from both atheism and theism, and the outline of this new religion is just becoming perceptible and it looks a little bit like us. For we can no longer support the notion of the anthropomorphized God of Moses or Mohammed, angry, jealous, capricious, violent, misogynist. Nor can we pretend that human reason will grow superior to the limitless universe that contains it. Where theisms fly in the face of what we know, atheisms fly steadfastly tone-deaf to the human longing for hope, transcendence, and a sense that there will always be more going on than we can ever fully grasp. The dialectic of history tells us that this clash of opposites, a clash which we now see gaining strength, will not yield a winner but a synthesis, born of the mulch, the wreckage of these dying ideologies. And like the bird, growing but hidden in the egg, like the seemingly lifeless tuber of the lily beneath the humus, this new religiosity waits for birth. And I sense its coming in the spring shoots of new stories and new metaphors, in, for example, the guise of the environmental movement, 
with its devout and worshipful observances of composting eggshells and orange peels to produce new fertile humus. In the humble and contrite offerings to the recycling truck every week of the evidence of our guilty, rapacious consumption. In the purification rites of growing and sharing local organic produce, which is becoming the new kosher, the new halal. And just as the councils of Nicaea and Trent solemnified a new world order of faith centuries ago, so world councils on climate change and environmental action proclaim the beginnings of a new world knighthood to serve our holiest of holies, the living planet which sustains us. Now this won't happen overnight. It won't happen in a flash. Nature, even the nature of ideas, takes its own time. A religion which is both rational and reverent toward that which is greater than us. Would we need a cheap conjurer's trick like a rabbit out of a hat to compel belief? No. Take that rabbit. We can dissect its physical nature down to the subatomic level. We can trace its evolution back to the first organic molecule. We, we can even clone them. We can copy the DNA that's given to us, but we can't make one ex nihilo out of the dust. We cannot make nature. Nature makes and remakes us. It is and ever will be that which contains us and is thus worthy of both rational inquiry and of humble reverence. The miracle was never in pulling the rabbit out of the hat. The miracle all along was the rabbit itself, the life force, quickened, procreative, symbol of the relentlessness of life, built just like us out of stardust a religion which seeks both to understand and to bless the limits of our understanding is a church I'd happily belong to, and happily I do. Our particular faith, accommodating both the rational and the reverent, accommodating the mind and the spirit, is, I believe, best placed to be the template for the religion yet to be. And if I thought differently, I wouldn't be standing here so testifying pulling the rabbit of hope out of the hat of an Easter service. So again, happy Easter. And as we celebrate this Easter, full of metaphors betokening new life from transformed bits, let us also celebrate the life that will come. Life transformed, may it spring forth in us, through us, and with us. Amen.